Thank you so much. That was really beautiful, really moving. So good. It's a pleasure to be with an honor to be with you today. And um, uh, usually when I talk about my work, I'm not in a church setting. And it's really a, um, to be in this setting, I think, is probably the most appropriate uh, space to talk about the subject matter that you all have asked me to speak about today, which is evolutionary spirituality. You know, the message is that, that human, the human relation to the divine, our religion, our sense of spirit, that this is actually evolving and growing and, and transcending what's come before. And evolutionary spirituality, which is what I'm going to talk about briefly, is in a sense that the, it, it holds the promise to those of us who are tr attracted to it. It holds the promise of being, in a sense, the spirituality of the future. It's, it's a form of spirituality. It's a family of spiritual views that's inclusive and pluralistically open. But it's also attempting to transcend the best of what's come before. Then my handy dandy changer there. Much, much of the information I'm going to talk about is from my new book, The Presence of the Infinite. And if I was to uh, design a talk for a half an hour, I would probably take one chapter and uh, you know, make that as, as accessible and simple as I could. But the part that I'm really passionate about is, is what you might call the through line, you know, the overall uh, arc of, uh, of, of the, um, the information. So I'm going to try to tease you with some of these big ideas. And um, you know, there's an event later tonight at SMU if you're interested to learn more. So evolutionary spirituality is emerging now as part of a new perspective, um, usually known as the integral perspective. Uh, integral philosophy is, is the, the, the under, understanding of the world that kind of enacts this new perspective. And evolutionary spirituality is, is, in a sense, the spiritual component of this new perspective. It's, it's a, a kind of spirituality that's attempting to push off against the shortcomings of all the other kinds of spirituality that come before, including traditional religious spirituality, progressive spirituality, even a secular view of the world. All of these have very important truths very important discoveries about the meaning of the universe and our place within it, that evolutionary spirituality attempts to, um, to, to, to carry forward in a new light. And the way it does this is by focusing on spiritual experience itself. So you could ask, well, what is really spiritual experience? I mean, what can we say about it more than it is the, the, the presence of the spirit in our lives? One of the ways evolutionary spirituality expands our understanding of spiritual experience, making us, allowing us to have it more abundantly and use it more effectively in our work. That is, spiritual experience can be understood as, as a form of spiritual energy that we can circuit, that we can take in and, and give out. And the more we encircuit this spiritual energy that comes from the experience of spirit, I think that uh, this is the, the most effective way of, of producing spiritual growth in ourselves and in making the world a better place. But spiritual experience, as I describe and argue in the book, in a sense can be understood literally as the presence of the infinite in the finite. Of course, spirit's more than simply infinity, more than simply a quantitative total of everything. Uh, it's also a qualitative infinity, if you will, and many different spiritual traditions take the idea of the infinite nature of spirit and, and develop it in different directions, whether it be a kind of a non-dual direction or a, or a theistic direction. But although there are very many ways, different ways of, of experiencing spirit, one of the ways evolutionary spirituality it, it sort of expands and improves our understanding of spiritual experience and our ability to have it is by bringing out the spiritual experience that's available in our experiences of the beautiful, the true, and the good. As Keva mentioned in, in her talking, that, that evolutionary spirituality could also be called beauty, truth, and goodness spirituality, because this is its main focus as well as its main method. So one of the ways that evolutionary spirituality attempts to transcend what's come before is by bringing in a, a kind of a new truth 
That's the most exciting part about it. I mean, there's goodness and beauty that goes with it, but it, the, the, the leading emerging edge of it is, is a more expanded truth about the nature of spirit. And the way that it, that it gets at this is by understanding this thing called a hermeneutic circle, which is a philosophical term to describe three different ideas that illuminate each other. In other words, spiritual experience is what we're after. You know, that's the focus of the book and the focus of evolutionary spirituality. And of course, spiritual practice of many different kinds, prayer, meditation, you know, service, there are many ways to, to practice spirit, and those practices lead to spiritual experience. But this, this spiritual experience as, as something that we can come to understand more is linked to spiritual teachings. And so it's by improving our spiritual teachings, improving what we understand to be spiritually true, that evolutionary spirituality is, is uh, bringing value to the spiritual scene. And the way that it does this is it understands that the, the scientific and historical story of evolution, you know, the, the, the revelation that the universe is only 13.8 billion years old, it's just three times older than the Earth itself, that, that, that everything in the universe is subject to evolution, not only matter, not only life, but our own consciousness and human culture, that human history is part of the extension of evolution. It, it can't be conflated with biological evolution, but it's real evolution nonetheless. And a truth this big, a truth that, that helps us understand our origins and, and how we embody evolution in ourselves, how we're in a sense the universe in, in person uh, as a result of evolution, this is a truth that transcends scientific facts. It's a truth that properly interpreted, has a deep spiritual message within it. So in the book, I talk about the spiritual teachings of evolution, and I'll briefly touch on five of those. The first one is that evolution creates value, you know, real value, not just anthropocentric human estimates of what, what's valuable, but ever since the Big Bang, something more keeps coming from something less. But when the something more emerges, it takes up and uses the value of what came before. So in a sense, we embody evolution completely. Every step in the structure of emergence that's led to the debris of the Big Bang, you know, hydrogen atoms, gradually, layer upon layer, evolution has been creating value. And all of the steps of value along the way are online and active within us. You know, water, is the main ingredient in our bodies. And hydrogen atoms are the main ingredient in water. And hydrogen is only created one time in the universe, right after the Big Bang. All the hydrogen atoms are, in a sense, an accomplishment of that first primordial emergence. And every, every you know, whether it's the periodic table of elements that are in our bones, the tree of life that's in our bodies, and even the accomplishments of human history that we use to make meaning in the present, in a sense, we embody the structure of emergence, and we embody value, and we, we, we are empowered to bring, to continue this structure of emergence and bring more value into the universe through our own actions. Which sort of brings to the, the second idea, this, this notion of the evolutionary impulse. There's the first Big Bang, as I mentioned, but with the emergence of life, there's kind of a second Big Bang. Something new enters the universe. Even though living things are made out of matter, they contain something more. And that's the striving to survive and reproduce. You know, matter can't fail, but life can. Life can fail to achieve its purpose, because it has purpose. That's what distinguishes life from non-life, is that life strives to survive and reproduce. And this, properly interpreted, I think is a very important spiritual teaching, because it helps us appreciate how we share with all of life the same urges, the same biological propensity to survive and reproduce. But with the emergence of humans, it's kind of a, a third Big Bang, a third domain of evolution. You know, although the structure of emergence is continuing, there's a, a, a new realm in which new forms of evolution become possible, and of course our global civilization is the, uh, the proof of that. But internally, this impulse to evolve becomes spiritualized. We, we become attracted to more value than simply the value of surviving and reproducing. We become 
engaged in a kind of a value gravity to give our gift, to live up to our potential, to make the world a better place, to achieve our own self-actualization and to help everyone self-actualize in the ways they can. And this sense of the evolutionary impulse, it's like to be human is to know what it feels like to be evolution happening. And so when we think about the purpose of the universe, we can see that purpose is certainly in the universe. It's what makes us get out of bed every morning. And because we embody the entire structure of evolution in our, in our bodies and our minds, we also embody this purpose of evolution in our evolutionary impulses to grow spiritually. So if we want to know what evolution's purpose is, all we really have to do is look within ourselves to the direct experience of our own purpose. You know, our purposes are its purposes. And this becomes spiritual when we understand that, in a sense, the beautiful, the true, and the good are the directions of evolution. These aren't necessarily static, platonic forms or absolute um, things. They're more verbs than nouns. They're, the, they're how we can make the world a better place, make ourselves more spiritually real, is by pursuing the beautiful, the true, and the good. And this is really one of the major themes of the book, which I spent a lot of time unpacking philosophically, that the beautiful, the true, and the good aren't just a convenient list. They're actually a, a kind of a system where one describes the other. They're like a jewel of truth, a, a conceptual cathedral that really has the power to guide us uh, in our life's decisions and to enliven our work. Whatever work we, we do, whatever, whether it's you know, your work in, in your career or parenting or your art or whatever you're doing, there's some element of it that's beautiful, true, or good. And by getting in touch with the essence, the spiritual essence, the, the presence of the infinite, which these values represent at their best, we can enliven our work and, and fulfill our own purposes by not only having more spiritual experience for ourselves, but also sharing spiritual experience with those around us and bringing more spirit into the world. Another very important teaching of evolution, at least interpreted through the lens of evolutionary spirituality, is that humans are, we have relatively free will. That of course we're all, you know, determined in a large extent by our biology, right, that our moods or, or, or uh, if something goes wrong with our body, it affects our consciousness significantly. We're also significantly determined by our culture, you know, the ways we make meaning, the worldviews that we, that we use to understand uh, what's real and what's true and what's good. These are highly influenced by our culture. But in between these deterministic influences of biology and culture, there's a small degree of freedom. And as we grow spiritually, this freedom expands. You know, it, it sort of, it takes the infinite to see the infinite, and we can understand the infinite within us as the freedom itself. You know, this freedom to be agents of evolution and not to be determined by these larger forces. We actually have a contribution to make to the perfection of the universe, gradually, step by step, goodness by goodness. And then the fifth one, the fifth tenet of evolutionary spirituality, again, I'm just teasing you here, this is a deep theological concept, this idea of panentheism. But the way to simplify it is that evolution itself shows that the, that the, the larger, the big picture of the universe is both infinite and finite. You know, that, that we know that the, the, the finite universe, in a sense, became a part if you will, of the infinite 13.8 billion years ago. And since then, this, the, 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 the being, the perfect being of the infinite has been supplemented by the becoming, you know, the being and becoming, infinite and finite, absolute and relative, creator and creation. This is the structure of the universe that's in a sense refracted into every step of our spiritual growth. This master pattern is, is, is like a fractal. It's, it, it's, a little, it's a motif of creation at every step. Another major element of evolutionary spirituality is this recognition of how panentheism, or the recognition of the structure of being and becoming, relates to how evolution occurs um, wherever the new is brought into being. So for example, male and female, you know, the, the motif of biological reproduction, 
can be understood as a, as a sort of a little fractal representative, a representation of this larger structure of the infinite and the finite, or the whole and the part. We can also see the same way that, that value is created, whether it's in mercy or justice or, or freedom and order. These interdependent polarities are little markers of, of the larger structure of the evolving universe itself. And where this teaching becomes particularly interesting is how it relates to our idea of what is ultimately real. Certainly something is ultimate. Right? The totality exists necessarily. And all forms of spirituality, in a sense, can give us access to ultimate reality, because the ultimate is not something that's far off, necessarily, in the remote Big Bang or the, the, circ the circ circumference of the finite universe. As I said, you know, the infinite lives within us, and so ultimate reality, in a sense, is closer to us than our own breath. But saints and sages throughout history, although they have um, touched on deep spiritual experiences of ultimate reality and brought, brought, brought back reports of its nature and character, th there's a wide diversity of reports from the saints and sages of history about what is ultimate reality. Within progressive spirituality, um, in the last few decades, a concept of ultimate reality that's gained a lot of traction is this idea of, of non-duality. Right? I know that Eckhart Tolle is a, is a big non-duality teacher who's popular in the Unity Church movement. And he's, he, Eckhart Tolle and other non-dual teachers have, have brought um, a, a very important part of spirituality that we can see within the Christ, Christian tradition with uh, great um, thinkers like uh, Meister Eckhart. You know, he's sort of a non-dualist in, in a Christian tradition. But, but non-dualism is primarily from the East. You know, the wisdom of the East, which has been brought to the West by many teachers within progressive spirituality. And how this relates to the spiritual experience is the way that non-duality, in a sense, can be understood as a, an attractor basin. It's a concept from chaos theory. That, that there's many kinds of spiritual experience that can be had with practices that yield non-dual spiritual experience, meditation specifically, often produces all kinds of spiritual experience. But the saints and sages of history have really pointed to an ultimate experience of whatever is absolute, which is known as the unitive experience, or samadhi, in many different religions. So this is a, you know, it's a form of spiritual experience that can be directly had. But this is still, even though it's experiential, it's still a truth teaching. Non-duality is still a form of spiritual teaching. And, and one of the things that evolutionary spirituality shows us is that all truth teachings, none of them are final. The truth is a direction of evolution. And so no matter what truth teaching, no matter how sublime, all truth is partial truth. It's like rungs on the ladder of our ascent. And so non-duality has taught me a lot, but it's also shown me that there's a partiality in this teaching, and a partiality that, that can complement and supplement and, and interact with in an interdependent polarity another very important truth and that is the idea of the love of God. And so when we compare the love of God, which, I mean, compassion, you know, is, is a cornerstone of non-dual spirituality, but, but non-dualism teaches that there's only one thing, which again is a, is a very important truth. The, the, the religious scholar Houston Smith said that the opposite of a small truth is a falsehood, but the opposite of a great truth is an equal and opposite great truth. And so within this idea of the love of God, there's, a, in a sense, another attractor basin of spiritual experience. It's not the same thing as non-duality. Although there's complementarity, although they, they can, the, the, the non-dual spiritual truth can complement theistic or God-centered spiritual truth, the love of God as an ultimate spiritual experience is it's irreducibly relational. Right? There's, there's, there's the lover and the beloved these things are, are the, the love by, by its very nature is, is a relationship. And so if you have a, a, a description of reality so there's no separation, it's hard to ground this idea of the love of God. Indeed, the idea of God herself, himself, is, is something that is, is a challenge to many non-dual spiritual teachings. But one of the great breakthroughs of evolutionary spirituality is that we're not trying to make them the same thing or force fit 
the oneness and the love of God, we can begin to see them in a sense as an interdependent polarity, wherein one can both complement and challenge the other. In other words, the wise non-attachment that is a, the central part of a non-dual spiritual practice is like one of the legs. Loving engagement is the other leg, and they work together. One doesn't need to, even though they contradict each other, it's in the procreative tension, just like the procreative tension of male and female, in a sense, lead to biological reproduction. This same universal motif can be seen in our experience of spirit, in this idea of the love of God and absolute oneness as attractor basins of spiritual experience, which are both available to us, but which aren't the same thing. Now, of course, ultimate reality is not plural. It's not, when we, when we understand that there's these two huge attractor basins of spiritual experience, it doesn't, we don't have to conclude that um, this interdependent polarity is simply the nature of ultimate reality. Ultimate reality is certainly one, but we don't want to mistake oneness for wholeness. And so when we see that, 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 that ultimate reality refracts into the finite universe as a polarity, we can maybe appreciate that this is a, a polar veil of how the ultimate looks within the finite. And so here in this, this symbol, the yin-yang symbol, the famous yin-yang symbol, is in a sense unified uh, by the three that are two that are one. You know, I think this idea of a trinity can incorporate both uh, non-duality and the love of God. And we can even play with the symbol to show how the same, uh, the same relationship of the being and the becoming is refracted, like the little fractal yin-yang. And so, the calla lily, which in a sense is, 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 is a representative of the three that are two that are one, is a perfect symbol for the presence of the infinite in the finite. And so when you see the beautiful, the true, and the good, when you experience it, know that what you're experiencing is this infinite presence that's available to us, and that is indeed the purpose of the universe. Thank you. certain people off my CD. Crowd. 
Thank you, certain people. Thank you so much.